Welcome, welcome to the Rick Helps Real Estate Show. It was 36 degrees outside this morning. <laughs> I didn't go outside. I just looked at my phone and said, holy jitters, that's cold. So today we're going to talk about the two things that you need to see before prices come down, if they come down. And that's what a lot of people are waiting for. They're waiting for some kind of shift where prices can come down or they're waiting for the big crash because, you know, we saw one in 2008. So that means it happens all the time. Um, no, but we are sitting at 6,500 homes on the market today. And here's what the seven day moving average looks like. Now, in the day of December 31st, the seven day moving average is going to be right here. It's going to just drop like a rock. And then then we see it start to come back up again as we get into the new year. And that's where we're hoping, hoping we will see more homes on the market. Now, yesterday, the Federal Reserve had their, uh, their meeting, their comments, and it was a great big nothing burger. Even though they said they're going to start pulling back on treasuries and mortgage-backed securities, um, we didn't see much movement. Uh, yesterday's rate, today's rate, 3.18, yesterday, 3.16. That could mean a couple of things. One, that the Federal Reserve does a pretty good job of telegraphing what they're going to say. So it was, or the pricing was already built into the market. Um, and number two, the traders, here's the treasury markets now. They went up a little bit yesterday and now they're coming back down. Uh, quite honestly, they don't believe that the economy is going to be rocking and rolling next year. They, the market traders are saying that, uh, that they think it's going to be slower than what the central bank is forecasting and for that reason they're not bailing out of the bond market so um, who knows and there are brighter minds than me but right now as we're looking forward and we're we got to first assess the situation that we're in in this real estate market in arizona and it always boils down to supply and demand but then there's other factors but you can't have a price reduction if your supply is low and right now our supply is 67 percent below what we consider normal. And our demand is up by 23%. So that's a real imbalance. So sellers, that's where you're looking at right now. And buyers, that's why there's bidding wars. And so these sales price measures are the last, sales price measures are the last things to change when the market shifts. In other words, things have to happen before prices move. So what are those things that we look for? Well, you know, one of them is actually the cost to the sellers. And what I mean by that, I'm going to turn my mic just a hair here, is right now, uh, sellers don't have to contribute to closing costs, and they're not. Um, they're not making very many repairs. Um, they're, they're not offering any concessions at all. In fact, they're getting over their list price. So if demand, so homes stay on the market longer too, and I want to show you this. This is, this is days on market. So here's where we're at. It's 31. Now, the reason it's 31 is it takes about 30 days to close. So 31 is from the day it went under contract to the day it closed. So it's rare that it gets much lower than 30. Here's 25.48. So this means that the home is getting a contract one or two days after it was listed. So that has to go up before sellers go, ooh, let's see. Uh, they're always going to test the ceiling. Sellers are going to say, well, I think I can get this. Now, they're used to getting an offer now in less than a week. If they start seeing that they're not getting that offer, then they really don't go in and start reducing the price right away. Um, sometimes they lower their asking price, but it doesn't overall shift the prices on the market. So if demand drops, sellers offer more concessions, such as warranties, closing costs, and repairs. That won't show up on any chart but it will be the result of more days on market. Then you'll start to see prices go. So at in 2020, we hit a peak of selling cost contributions right here of 26% seller paid closing costs compared now with only 2.1. See where we're at there? There's, there's 4.1 there uh, for Q4, but here's closing costs by city. This one I find very interesting. Here we are, 2.1. That's uh, that's not seller cost by city. I got to change that. But here, here was our peak up here with 
and now only 2.1% of the homes are contributing to closing costs. You just can't get that done. That number will change before prices get reduced. Here's the one by city. Superior, 25% are contributing towards closing costs. And you get down to the bottom here, Fountain Hills, nobody. Now, if Fountain Hills all of a sudden starts having less demand and higher inventory, you're going to see that number change. And when that number changes, that's an indication that we are starting to reach a more balanced market. It's getting kind of harder to sell your home. So you're going to offer more things before you reduce the price. So somebody comes up and they say, oh, you're asking uh, $700,000 for the house. And they write you a full price offer, but then they're going to ask you for, uh, can you help me with my closing costs? Um, can you contribute like $2,500 towards my closing costs? Uh, will you make the following repairs? Hey, can you throw in a home warranty? And those things are going to start trickling in. And then at that point, you're going to know that the market is starting to see a bit of a shift. Phoenix has got 4% of the homes contributing to closing costs, Tempe 3%. But you can see this number is really low, especially when you see it done on a historic basis, like closing costs weekly here. We're down at the bottom. You just don't have to do it. Uh, my brother's in the middle of selling their vacation property um, in Washington State, and Boy, I tell you, um, if you're a realtor in Washington State, um, you guys got it tough up there, man. They got more rules and forms. Get this. So the inspection comes, and he wants to see the inspection report. I mean, we always do when you're listing a home. The agent said, well, um, they only want to send you, you the list of things that they would like to have repaired. If we send you the entire report, now we, have, we are obligated to disclose that. That part's true in Arizona as well. It's called material facts. So you give me the inspection report says you need a new roof. Well, that's a material fact. I have to explain that to any other buyers if this deal falls out. By the way, the roof is bad. Or by the way, this home has a plumbing issue. But up there, they wanted to piecemeal it. And they can. And they can say, we want you to fix this broken door and this beam. And uh, we want you to credit us X amount of dollars at close of escrow. Well, what about the rest? What else is broken? Well, we really don't want to send you that. It just sounds like um, an ethics problem to me, collusion, but I could be wrong. I don't do work up there. But it, So they sent just piecemeal a few things and he had to sign off on it before they could send him the inspection report. I just found that very odd. Down here, when we get a home inspected, if I'm the listing agent and I get the report, I send it to the, to the buyer's agent right away even before we decide what, what we're going to ask for in repairs. And that, in a market that starts to slow down, you can find that buyers are going to start asking for more repairs. So I always send it off first before my seller and I have a chance to sit down and talk about it because I want the buyer's agent to be thinking about what they're going to ask for as well. Or no, I do it the opposite. I'm saying when I'm a, when it's not when I'm a seller. It's when I'm representing the buyer, I send it to the seller because I want the seller to see what we found that was broken before we asked for it. I got that little bass backwards there. And I'm not trying to be tricky. It's like, you know, the, the repair part is one of the stickiest parts of the real estate process. And so you just kind of need more time to start thinking about this stuff. Then when I get on the phone and go, hey, I'm sending a, uh, I sent you the report. I want to let you know this is what we're asking for. And it, it doesn't shock them. You don't want to shock the other agent and go, here's 15 things. You know, and they didn't even have time to go over the report yet. So it's far different than Washington State. I thought that was really, really interesting. Now, going forward, um, this week and next week on mortgage rates, nothing. It's just going to bobble along flat. We've already had the news from the Fed. The Fed says they're going to start raising rates and start tapering. But the, even raising rates, they aren't giving any indication how much they're going to go. They don't want to clamp that down too fast. Now, you're going to see videos, people saying we have hyperinflation coming. No, we never have hyperinflation. We have periods of higher inflation. But hyperinflation is places like Venezuela and Zimbabwe, where things are going up 50% a day. Or in Germany in the 30s, when factory workers were throwing their paychecks out the window to their wives so they could go, go to the grocery store at lunch or go to the bank at lunch because they knew that 
by dinner time, their, their currency would be worth even less. So they were getting paid twice a day. That's hyperinflation. You're not going to see hyperinflation in the United States because of our central bank. If inflation starts getting out of control, they will clamp down like Paul Volcker did in the 80s and raise rates, slow the economy down, contract everything. It's painful and inflation will come back down. You won't see hyperinflation. So when you see those headlines, just click past it. They're, they're lying to you. The inflation if it starts and looks like it's going to be sticking then the federal reserve's going to have to start pulling back on their on their hit on their assistance they're going to have to raise rates but you know keep in mind we're at zero right now the fed funds rate is zero so are they going to go up to two percent if they do it's going to be very very slowly so i don't expect to see a whole lot going on between now and march and We'll see what happens, but I can tell you between now and New Year's Day, nothing is going to be going on. So we'll keep checking back here and we will look at this. If you do have your house on the market, do not take it off for Christmas Day. People aren't going to come visit it anyway, so leave it on. Don't, don't take it off and then put it back on. Just leave it on because Christmas Day, people are going to be sitting around with their phones going, oh, I wonder what's for sale, and you want your home to be there. So take on the day. Have a great week. Put on a coat. See ya.